Okay, fire away. Hello, everyone. I'm Anthony. I'm founder and CEO at Seed Legals. Delighted to be here. Um, I've been asked to talk about term sheets. So moments ago, there was a term sheet mentioned. I did. I was amused by the I'm in the neighborhood. I'll drop around. It's like if someone says to me, I'll drop around. It's like I'll call the police if you try and do that. So <laughs> I think it's an American kind of thing. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. At Seed Legals, I talk to many, many founders. I see many term sheets at people periodically send me to have a look at. So today we're going to go through a hypothetical term sheet. So when an investor sends you their term sheet, you can dive into the things that are important for your deal. You can look out for the gotchas. You can figure out which things are okay to agree to and which ones are not market. So just taking a step back, you know, when you're raise, raising from angel investors, you can normally send them your term sheet. So you'll hop on C Legals, create a term sheet. Um, and, you know, raising from angels is the lowest cost uh, of capital that you can get. You're not paying crowd platforms. You know, they're not looking for preference shares typically. But of course, if you're raising a million pounds, that's a lot of angel investors. So it's something point it's going to move from angels to raising from VCs. In between angels and VCs, there are your SEIS, EIS funds like Hatch, Startup Funding Club, SFC, Fuel Ventures, and more. And those come with uh, good parts. They uh, fuel early stage startups, but they're also looking for their fees in different ways. So we're going to dive into that to look out particularly for the things that you're going to see in term sheets from SEIS and EIS funds. So without further ado, let me turn on screen sharing. And because term sheets are confidential, I've prepared a term sheet from the hypothetical Helpful Ventures, and uh, Helpful Ventures has sent you a term sheet. And now, in the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to go through it and see what makes sense and what doesn't. So let's begin. Helpful Ventures, smiley logo at the top, and they tell you at the beginning how wonderful they are. I think you can safely ignore all the yada yada about how it's not just money, it's we're here to help. When I, you know, if you have gone looking for office space or looking for an apartment, the more they outline the wonders of the lobby and the bicycle shell and the racks and the, the showers uh, for everyone, you know that the office is going to be terrible. And likewise with VCs, when they tell you it's not just about the money, that means they're about to lowball you on the valuation. So, um, you know, I, to me, I think VCs often overplay how fabulous they're going to be and the help they're going to provide. But actually, they're doing many, many deals. And 15 minutes after investing in your company, they've completely forgotten about you and moved on. So to me, I take the main value as the money. And if they make intros and evangelize my company, that's amazing. But I'm not going to count on it as being part of the value they're going to bring. All right, so that aside. So now, are they going to invest... Uh, 250K on a pre-money valuation of 1.25 million. So that means that they're going to own 250K out of 1.5 million at the end of the round, 16%. That is fantastic. And that's just median uh, for, value, for, for uh, dilution in a funding round. So our data at Seed Legal shows that uh, founders normally dilute around 15% in a round. So you take the amount that you want to raise, you multiply it by five, so the investors own one in six, 16% near enough. That's just perfect. But wait, on the next line, they say this offer is conditional on the company raising another 250K. So this is not atypical. And what's ha happening here is in your uh, business plan, you've said to the investor, Essentially, we need 500K to get to build the product, get to our next milestones, get product market fit, scale, and so on. And they've correctly said, well, you've told us you need to 500K. We're in for 250, so you need to go and find another 250. That's not a real problem, except now that you're raising 500K on a 1.25 million valuation. So that's 500 out of uh, 1.7. 
So that's like 25% or thereabout uh, dilution, which is quite a lot. And so more than 25%. So in fact, uh, maybe raising uh, 500K at 1.2 million is quite a lot lower valuation than you'd like. And you either really want to raise less or you want to raise at a higher valuation. But this investor has said that they're investing at 1.25. So this is probably, this deal is probably going to dilute you more than you want, even though at face value, it looks great. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. So the next thing is, the investors asking for SEIS shares. So it's an SEIS EIS fund. We're going to get to that in a minute. And they're saying they want a 1x non participating preference. Now, let's dive into that. I think we all know, you know, common wisdom that uh, if you want SEIS, you have to get ordinary shares. VCs later on will get preference shares. So, what is a preference share? A preference share says that when you sell your company later, if it's what's called a non-participating preference, the investor gets their choice of their money back, their investment money back, or their pro rata, their, in other words, their proportional share of the uh, exit proceeds of sale that they would have got based on their percent equity, which means if you've got a le low valuation exit, the investor says, I'll take my money back. But if you sell for $100 million, they'll say, actually, give me my 10% of that. I'll take that. So it protects the investor. That's a non-participating preference. There's also a participating preference where the investor says, I'll get my money back. And then also, I'll get a share of the remainder. So let me give you an example of how this would work and how it affects you. So let's say that you raise a million pounds and your investor's getting, let's say, 10% equity. So that's a 9 million valuation. And actually, business is not so good and you sell at a 5 million valuation a couple of years later. Now, as founders, if you own half the shares roughly, let's say, let's say you own 40% each, that's, uh, you know, you're going to get a million pounds or so back or 2 million pounds back from a 5 million sale each. That's great. Your partner, when you get home, is going to be delighted at that outcome. But for the investor, the sale is about half the price of the investment, so they're going to lose half their money if they just had ordinary shares. So imagine instead that they had a non-participating preference, which is what you've said here. So the investor would say, if you're selling at 5 million and I've got 10% equity, I'd get half a million back. But actually, you know what? I'll take the preference part of it. I'll take my money back. So they're going to get a million pounds back, and the rest of the shareholders will share four million. But if they had a participating preference, then they would say, I'll take my million back first. That's four million remaining. And now I'll get 10% of that as well. So that's uh, 1.4 uh, million, and now everyone else shares 3.6. So you may find that the amount you get back is a lot less, particularly if the investor's got a participating preference. So to wrap up what's this uh, mildly technical interlude is that uh, a 1x non-participating preference is basically something that a VC is going to ask for. If you're raising from angel investors, they usually don't know that they can get an SEIS, EIS compatible version of that. They can't get preference shares, but they can get on seed legals, what we call an A ordinary share with this liquidation preference. Now, SEIS funds do know this. And so you're seeing here from the fund saying, I would like a 1x non participating preference. And you're unlikely to win the battle to get them not to do that. So in this case, we're going to agree to it. And remember that a, a non-participating preference is only costly for you if you exit essentially at lower than the valuation of this round. If you exit at a higher valuation, it's not going to kick in. And so here, the valuation at 1.2 million, and if you sell the business for 3 million later, this preference won't cost you anything. But if it's less than a million or 1.2, it will cost you. All right, good. So now we come to the option pool. So we all know 
hopefully, that investors are looking for a free money option pool in a round. What does this mean? It means they want you to create the option pool prior to the round, because creating an option pool serves to dilute everyone who's already in the cap table. So they don't want to be diluted out uh, right after their investment. They want everyone else before them to get diluted. So that's par for the course. No investor is going to want to invest and immediately get diluted when you give options to your team. But here they're asking for what's called a 15% uh, free money option pool. So that's 15% dilution that you're going to have as the existing shareholders in this round. Um, and I would say 15% is a bit on the high side. In the US, often it's 20% option pools. In the UK, it's more like a 10% would be the standard. So you might want to push back on that slightly. You might win it or not. Uh, the fund is usually going to ask for a, well, often will ask for a slightly larger option pool so that they don't get diluted sometime in the future. But, you know, often companies will exit or, they haven't allocated all their options, and you've diluted yourselves unnecessarily. So try to stay to ideally no more than a 10% option pool. All right. So the next thing, and by the way, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat, and I'll hand over to MA to read those because I can't actually see the chat because I'm looking at the camera. Okay. So if you've got any, uh, mention those, MA. All right. So now investors, astute investors, know that when they invest, they're only going to get you know 10% equity or so. So the founders, at least in the early stages, have got 80% or more equity. And if you've got more than 75% equity between the founders, you can vote to do anything you want. You can issue more shares, you can waive preemption, um, you can sell the company for less than the investors' uh, you know, investment valuation and more. So the investors recognize that even though they've got little equity, they still want to protect themselves. So how do they do that? They ask for investor majority consent on certain things, and they may also want a director on your board. So the, the secret is that investors will often ask for the right for an a director on your board, but then proceed to not take up that right and get an observer position instead. So a director on your board is quite an onerous, I mean, it comes with statutory legal responsibilities. You can be criminally liable if the company trades insolvent and so on. So the investor would like to be on your board, would like to have a vote, but as a practical matter, maybe they just can't be fussed doing it. So you'll often see that they would like a board seat, but failing, if they don't take it up, they'll have an observer seat instead. An observer doesn't really cost you anything. They don't have a vote. They can't change the direction of anything, but you do need to share the board pack with them beforehand. So it does mean that you can't skip the formality of, hey, Laura, we're doing a board meeting today. Great, yeah, what did we approve? Awesome, we're done. You actually have to send out some materials beforehand because the investor is going to see it. But apart from that, you know, they're just going to drink the coffee and eat the biscuits if you do physical board meetings, but there's not a big overhead in having uh, an investor as an observer on the board. So in particular, if you have several investors wanting board seats, remember that the founders should always outnumber the investors on the board. Otherwise, you can have a Sam Altman situation where the investors can get you fired. And if you have an even number of uh, uh, directors, then try to make sure that the founders have got, one of the founders has got the casting vote in the event of a deadlock. So if you have multiple investors wanting board seats, try and steer one or more of them to get a, an observer seat instead. All right, so that's everything to do with the board. And here you can see that the investors are asking for uh, two founder directors, that's fine. One investor director, which is their guaranteed right to a director on the board. And then one uh, NED or an independent director, which together you're going to appoint. So, you know, if you can find somebody that you really want on your board, that's great. But remember that your board, I think founders often think the board is this wonderful place where everyone gets together and thinks about the future and brainstorms ideas. The caution is the board can be like the police. They can block things that you want to do, 
And uh, also the investors or other board members, you know, you're living your company 24 seven. They dip in one day a month or one day a quarter with words of wisdom. Yes, you should pivot to be a SaaS business. No, you shouldn't do this, but they know nothing about your business. And they aren't seeing the consequences of the things they are suggesting. So I'm always cautious to only have on the board people that are really part of the business, or otherwise they've given me millions of pounds and I can't not have them on the board unless, yeah. So so my caution on just inviting people onto the board, because once they're on, it's also hard to get rid of them. All right, so now let's go for investor consent. So this is the bit where I mentioned that many things need shareholder votes, issuing more shares, in theory, shutting down the company and so on. Um, and uh, the problem is if the founders between them own most of the shares, they get most of the votes, and so they can do anything. So the investors are going to say there are a certain number of things called the reserve matters, where in addition to the shareholders overall agreeing, we also need to agree and this could be the share. The, the investors have what's in called investor majority consent. So it's typically if more than 50% by number of voting shares, not just by people, agree you need those consents to do this list of things. And when you see this list of things, you go, oh, my God, I can't do anything. So let's go through these. And then broadly, they fall, I think, into two or three categories. Category one is good, and the others are less good. So category one, basically, you want to be able to run your company on a day-to-day -day basis without having to do board meetings or go to your investors to get their agreement. So if you want to hire a new head of marketing, you just want to hire the person. You don't want to go, sorry, I can't hire you because I need to get investor consent. And you don't want to keep writing to all your investors to tell them every time you want to hire someone their salary. So the day-to-day -day things to run your company, you should just be able to do yourself as CEO and so on. Certain larger things, you may need to go to the board you want to create a subsidiary. Going to the board is generally pretty easy. I mean, you may have to schedule it, but you know the board sits together and you know the founders are part of it. So it's not a huge amount of friction. And some things you now need to go to your investors and you want to minimize those. So what's happening over here is the investors asking for lots of things to be investor consent. Firstly, it's a big list. And secondly, some of these could actually be made board consent matters instead of investor consent matters. So let's go through some of these to give you the flavor. So winding up the company or putting it into administration, well, that makes sense. You know, you, otherwise you can get you can get bored with the business, close it down, and the investor loses all their money. But I do see quite a few companies these days reaching out to me directly saying business isn't going well, it's usually a co-founder dispute, we want to close the business, and my investor is, you know, not letting me do it. Actually, in this case, you know, the, the directors can force the company to go into administration if it's risk of trading insolvent, but um, beware, there may be cases where the founder's goals and the investor's goals don't align. So this one, you're probably not going to win to get into administration. Um, issue uh, or redeem any share capital. So this is also a reasonable one. This means that basically you can issue more shares, which could dilute the investors. You need their consent. Do an IPO. Realistically, 36, people, 36 companies IPO'd last, last year. 8,000 had an exit. Nobody's ever going to do an IPO. So whatever it is relates to IPO, you just don't care because anyway, you're going to have several more funding rounds with more docs before your IPO. Change the company's articles. Normally, you need 75% shareholder majority to update your articles. And here the investors saying, actually, you could probably do that yourself as founders. You want our permission. But that's probably okay. But once we go 
lower down, you can see that this gets into the things that are your company internal things like approve the annual budget. This should be a matter for the board. You don't want to have to write to all your investors saying, please have a vote to let me know if I've improved, approved the budget or not. I think that's a real pain. So I would really push back on that. You also can't agree with your sales team that you're going to pay them bonuses if you have to get investor consent to pay their bonuses. What if the you've agreed bonuses at the end of the year, the investors disagree? So things like these should become board matters or not. So, you know, category one are things that reasonably protect the investors. Category two are major risks for the company starting up a new, you know, you want to launch in America or something. These should become board matters. And then other things should just be day-to-day -day matters that you just get on with yourself. So think about these. All right. Now we get on to uh, founder vesting. So I think also we probably know that uh, it's good that the founder's shares have vesting. I must say the number one reason for companies closing down or not working out that I see, at least from people who contact me or post in founder message boards, are founder fallouts. And it's always the case that, you know, uh, someone hits us up on web chat on Seed Legal saying, got a dispute with my co-founder, what to do next? Our team reply, do you have founder agreements with vesting? If yes, let's look at what they say. Hopefully it's corresponds to what you'd like to do now. But if no, it's kind of pistols at dawn because there's a bun fight. Somebody wants to be bought out for half a million pounds. Nobody's got any money. And then everything falls apart. So founder share vesting is really important, noting that it's a double-edged sword. So if your co-founder has a fight and they need to leave and they're not performing, you want them to lose some fraction of their shares and have to give them back. But it's you who's being forced out. No, I want to keep all my shares. So it's a bit more complicated and it's something you need to think about quite carefully. And if you're looking for data on this, if you do a Google search for Seed Legal's Termometer, or you go to the resources section on the Seed Legal site and you'll see the Termometer, there's data for absolutely everything you see here from thousands of funding rounds to see what founders choose, and they grouped into small, medium, and large rounds. So you can see actually what's market. And if your investor is giving you a hard time, you and 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 the data supports what you want to do, you can send them to the termometer as well and go. Actually, you know, eighty-five percent of the time this is the case, and so I think your demand that it's uh, crazy is unreasonable. You know, or or you can might conversely go. Actually, what they want is quite reasonable. I'm being unreasonable. All right, so um, I will probably skip the. Actually, let's quickly go through drag along and tag along. Drag along is uh, for those who don't know. One of the challenges is if you want to sell your company, you might have some small shareholder who's going. Actually, I want you to pay me zillions to buy me out. Uh, you can't just sell my shares on me like that. So you can be held hostage by smaller shareholders who demand that you buy out their shares on you know terms that are way off what uh, you're selling your own shares at. And that's where drag along comes in. It says if the majority of the shareholders want to sell, the minority ones or the remainder ones are dragged along and they get the same deal terms, but they're forced to sell. So drag along is really, really important. Now, one of the important things to know with drag along is if you set the drag along percent too low, it might be your investors who want to sell the company and you're dragged along. So normally drag along is going to be somewhere between about 50 and 75%. If those group of people agree to sell the business, everyone else is dragged along. Tag along means that small investors can tag along and get the same good deal terms that the larger ones get so they don't get screwed. And that's quite reasonable. Co-sale right is quite interesting. Co-sale is saying uh, if you as a founder want to sell your shares, that's okay potentially, but all the other shareholders have the right to sell that percent of their shares as well. And this is saying that basically, if you're a founder and you're selling out of the business, we want out as well. And uh, it sounds at first glance 
that's fine. But actually, if you, co-sale rights can make it quite difficult for you as a founder to sell your shares. So let's say that you want to sell a million pounds of your shares. This is great. You can pay off your mortgage. You're going to pay any 10% capital gains tax under the entrepreneur relief. It's a great way of getting money out of the business at low tax rates. And you've been paying yourself a low salary for a while. You want to sell your shares. But the co-sale right mean that you can't go to your buyer and going, I'm going to sell you a million pounds of my shares. You have to then go to everyone else and saying, I want to sell 20% you know, of my shares. Everyone else will go, oh, that sounds great. We'd like to sell some of our shares as well. Then you go back to the buyer and say, sorry, I can't sell you 20% of my shares. I can sell you 10% and all these other people want to sell as well. So it adds a lot of friction. Now, one way around that is if you do your funding round on seed legals, we've got an ability to say the founders can sell X percent of their shares, defaults to 10%, without these co-sale rights applying. And some founders take advantage of this at the next funding round or beyond, so that they can sell their shares without this friction as an overhead. So now you know all about drag, tag, and co-sale. And these are good things to know about. So when investors say, you know, do you have drag and tag? You don't look at them like they're from Mars. You go, absolutely, yes. All right, now, information rights, uh, monthly reports, not the end of the world, but it's gonna be a drag to do those reports every month. So if you can get by with quarterly reports, that's really market standard. Some investors will insist on monthly KPI updates so that maybe you can automate it or you can create something that uh, pulls in your Google and your Stripe and your HubSpot or whatever data so you don't have to spend much time and give investors their reports. They're probably demanding the reports. Whether they'll ever read them afterwards remains to be seen. But if you can try to go for quarterly, you're going to probably be happier. I mean, some founders, I mean, common wisdom from investors is the only time they ever hear from founders is when they want more money. And if only they had sent us reports and kept us in the loop, we'd love them a lot more. So of course, you want to keep your investors in the loop um, and give them updates and so on. But that's a bit different to committing to every month, give a sort of formal report, which will then be defined in the shells agreement and so on, exactly what it contains. Maybe you're away on holiday, you don't feel like doing it that month and so on. So. More reporting is, in general, good, although I'm rubbish at doing it myself, my, really my co-founder, um, and uh, but, but try and avoid the commitments. All right, so now founder salaries, um, you know, one of the things that investors fear is that they'll invest in a company and the founders will promptly vote to pay themselves a lot more money, and if they control the board and if they have the majority votes, then they can do so. And so they, the investors are saying, we're going to cap your salary that you can pay yourself without our consent. Now, this is something I don't like as an investor consent, because it means you have to write to all your investors going, I'd like to increase my salary. That's a bit demeaning. It should be a board matter, uh, if anything. But, uh, you know, if you and, and I've seen investors refuse, I mean, you, you some of them make a big drama of it and refuse because uh, business isn't good. But, hey, you've still got rent to pay um, and uh, you, you may or may not win this. You might put uh, a little bit of an increase in what you've got now so you don't need to go too soon. But but note that some investors will ask for that. All right. I We'll dive into probably the lever provisions and then just jump to a few of the investor costs and then we'll go to Q&A. So the lever provisions um, are interesting. So as founders, again, having seen OpenAI and the board firing Sam Altman and so on, you think the biggest fear is that the investors will look to get rid of you. Turns out from looking at lots and lots of startups, the number one, by a long shot, are founder fallouts. And uh, sometimes, I mean, you know, it's usually the remaining founder that contacts us or contacts me saying, what do I do? Sometimes it's, it's, it's just the two of them can't or three of them can't agree. Sometimes somebody's underperforming and somebody wants to get rid of them. Sometimes a couple of them group together and they, they gang up on the other one. But 
there's right and there's wrong. It's often difficult to see which is which. But the problem is, if you don't have the right lever provisions, then everything is a mess. And so have a look at the Seed Legal's Termometer data on the lever provisions to see if you lose your shares, if you're a, you know, if you're a good lever or a bad lever, you lose the vested or unvested. And again, it's a double-edged sword because if you want to protect yourself and keep all your shares pretty much regardless, if your co-founder is forced out of the business, they'll also keep their shares and then you've got a mess. But on the flip side, if you say everyone loses their shares, you don't want to be working for you know put two years of your life into the business. There's some dispute. You leave. You want to keep the ones you've done your time for, so to speak, and uh, find the ones that have invested yet. That's fine. You haven't really earned those, but you don't want to lose everything. So it's a double-edged sword. And if you have any Q and A on that, we can do that in a few minutes. All right. Now let us dive into the fees that uh, SEIS funds in particular charge, because there's a good chance statistically that you'll be raising from an SEIS fund. You know, SFC do 90 investments a year. I think Hatch does like 40 or so, Fuel does dozens. So the, S the SEIS and EIS funds do a ton of startup investment. So here's the thing to note, and I'll stop sharing for a minute. Actually, I don't think my image gets any bigger here. Um, which is the SEIS funds. Okay, so when an angel investor invests in your business, you know they, they just give you their money and you hope to give them a return on the investment. When a VC raises investment from their LPs, the limited partners, so VCs raise investment just like you raise investment and goes into their fund. But those fancy buildings they've got in Mayfair and all the VCs who pay themselves a salary, where does that money come from? Well, their investors put money into the fund and they take money from their own fund to pay their bills. But with an SEIS or EIS fund, the investors in that fund want all of their money to flow through to your company because that's how they get their SEIS. So the funds can't dip into a pot to pay their own bills. So how are they going to make money other than on an exit, of course, which could be far away. So what they do is they charge fees, their fees to you directly. And you'll see the funds uh, fees appearing in different ways. So with that in mind, let me go back to uh, screen share and let's have a look. So the first thing is <clears throat> that they're going to ask for a 10% arrangement fee. So they're finding 250K, so you're going to have to pay them 25K for that. And then, and by the way, a 10% arrangement fee is not atypical. You know, often an advisor would charge 6%. So 10% is pretty high. And by the way, at Seed Legals, we're launching deals so that we can find investors for you, and we're charging 2%, and it's on success only. So 10% is definitely on the high side. Additionally, they are asking for a £3,000 a year management fee, which is basically a bullshit fee, but it's a way of getting some money back. Now, the management fee, you're probably not going to win that because that's conditional on the investment, but you can try and cap it to some number of years because you don't want to be like 10 years later and you're still paying them three grand a year for doing very little. So you may or may not win that, but again, it's going to add up as well. And then they uh, further up above, you may well be asked to pay uh, for their investor director. You may be asked to pay a, a fee to cover their investor director fees, which might be another few thousand pounds a year. So all up from SEIS, EIS funds, and I'm not knocking them because everyone's got to make a living, but your lowest cost of capital is always raising directly from angel investors. And if you're raising from a VC, it's going to be costly in preference shares and anti-dilution and so on. And if you're raising from an SEIS fund, you know, you, you need to watch out and look carefully for the management fees and the arrangement fees and other things. A um, couple of last quick things, which is if an investor wants a director on your board, 
they're probably going to ask you to get directors and officers, DNO insurance. This is going to cost you one or two thousand pounds a year, and it insures the directors for if in case they sued. Generally, the company will pay the directors' fees, but of course, the company might run out of money. So it's useful to have insurance as founders you're probably not going to spend company money on uh, direct insurance for yourself, at least not until later stage. But if there's an outside director, they don't have the rewards of you as a founder with all your equity, so they generally want to be insured. So that's a cost, not huge, but to know about. Um, then there's the investor's legal fees. So usually the good news with the SEIS and EIS funds is uh, they don't ask you to pay their legal fees, or if they do, it's a modest amount. Many of the SEIS funds are using seed legal, so they don't charge you for their legal fees. But if it's a VC, they may have a cap of £20,000 or even more. In the case of Octopus Ventures, I almost fell off my chair. They, had a, they said, you'll pay our legal fees. I saw on a £3 million round up to a cap of £100,000 mental. So the challenge with uh, capping uh, a high cap to pay the investors legal fees, there are two problems. One, of course, you can hire yourself a software developer plus for more than a year for that. And number two, the more money you pay their lawyers, the more uh, the lawyers are going to try and make work for themselves because it's kind of like guaranteed income. So they're going to be trying to change every word and mess around. So you want to try and reduce that cap as much as possible. You know, if you're doing a seed round, try for a cap of £5,000, certainly no more than £20,000. And if you're being asked for more than that, you know, definitely drop me a note if you're on seed legals and uh, we'll see what we can do to come up with something to reduce that. All right. Um, uh, and one other thing quickly, which is to note the exclusivity period. So it's easy to sign a term sheet. You go, yeah, I've got a term sheet. That's awesome. Let me pay. Let, let me sign that. But now it's saying over here from 60 days, you can't uh, solicit or engage off, uh, offerings of equity from uh, other parties or inconsistent with this. This means that you know, the investor, having gotten you to sign their term sheet, can just sit and do nothing for two months, at the end of which they go, nah, you know what, we've thought about it, nah, we're not interested, and you've just lost two months while you couldn't really proceed with fundraising. So, you know, ideally keep the exclusivity to 30 days or less. Uh, if you can't, 45 days would be really the top, but uh, 30 days or less is uh, very useful. And then also check carefully the wording to see what you can or cannot do. Usually it's that you can't solicit other offers. Here, it's slightly different. It's saying inconsistent with this term sheet. And that's because at the top, they said that actually you need to find another 250K so you can shop around within that. But often it will say you can't shop around at all. All right, so that was the uh, term sheet walkthrough. I hope you know everything about term sheets now. And now, MA, if you'd like to go through any questions. Yes, um, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, I have a few questions to ask you first. Sure. And then Alessia, we'll go to you. Um, I know you wrote the question, um, but I'm a little confused. So if you want to come on and ask it live, I think that might be best. Do you good for that? Just give me a thumbs up if you want. Yes. Amazing. Shall I go? You want to just ask your question now? Just go for it. Um, yes. So basically it was around participating in um, uh, and not participating for investors. So we were talking about uh, participating was uh, receiving um, the 10% on the remain 4 million. I didn't understand if it was the 10% on the remaining 4 million or the 10% of the total. So they Got take it. the capital and then 10% of the 5 million. So a participating preference means the investor gets their money back first, yeah. and then they share in the remainder after you've taken off their money, because that's the remainder that everyone shares yeah. as a shareholder, and they count as a shareholder as well for the purpose of that. So okay. really a, a, a preference share 
if you sell your company for a huge amount, it doesn't really matter. So, you know, at Seed Legals, we raise three million pounds with Index Ventures. They've got preference shares. If we sell the company hypothetically for a hundred million pounds, the fact that they get their three million back first or whatever, nobody cares. It's and it's a non-participating preference. But if things are bad and we sell the company for three million pounds, they get their three million back. And the founders get the remainder, which is zero. So if you have a low value exit, the fact the investors have preference shares, regardless, you know, is going to mean that you as founders can get back very little. But uh, by the way, one other thing with preference shares is throughout the world, investors pretty much always get preference shares. Uh, that's because that protects their investment um, and protects them. They get their money back first, even if you have a low value exit of the company. The single place in the world that's a bit different is the UK, because SEIS rules say that you have to have ordinary shares. You can't get preference shares. And most investors don't know that you can actually get a liquidation preference even on an ordinary share. So when you're raising from angels, you're going to try and steer them to ordinary shares, at least in your early rounds, because that's advantageous for you. On a sale of the company, they don't get their money back first. So that's the secret trick with uh, ordinary shares and angel investors and to know when to push back and not. All right. Okay. Next question. Yeah, um, I want to quickly take a moment to chat about co-founder fallouts. Um, because I think that's is probably something that I know people have questions about, but no one wants to ask a live question about it for very obvious reasons. Um, what are what are the reasons that you see co-founders fall out? And what's your best advice for founders who need to fundraise in the midst of a co-founder fallout? Great question. So firstly, by the way, for those who are not members, you might want to join the Anonymous Founders chat group. So if you Google Landscape VC, Anonymous Founders, then because uh, it's anonymous, you'll see a lot more of those questions being posted. You'll probably quite quickly work out who I am as well, but it's, uh, it's, it's a great resource and a place to ask those kind of questions. So what are the most common founder fallouts? I think that in the early stages, you know, when you start, you've probably got a day job and it may turn out that one of the founders doesn't want to give up their day job and you putting in all the time and they're not putting in all the time. Other reasons are that you disagree. One of them wants to be B2B and the other one wants to be B2C. The other one is simply they just not pulling their weight and not working out and you putting your heart and soul into the business and they, it's a bit meh. Yeah, they drift in and out. And sometimes, you know, the feedback is actually they'd be great as an employee and employees, somebody you give money to, and hopefully they don't just work nine to five, but you know, if they do, so be it. And they're going to give you some great code or marketing or whatever they're going to do. But a founder is someone who's got the weight of the world on their shoulders to make the company a success. And sometimes it's just not working. I think sometimes it's just the asymmetry that one founder feels they're putting way, way more time into it than another. There are many different reasons. The question is, can the founders split up amicably or not? And it seems anecdotally 10 or 20% of the time in an early stage company, there'll be a founder fallout. And it seems that if the founder that's departed has got somewhere between, well, if it's less than 5% equity overall that they're left with, it's not a problem going forward. If it's 10%, it's going to be an issue to some investors. And if it's more than 10%, then it becomes a problem for next funding rounds. So... The other, so so you ideally want to come to an arrangement with an existing founder, so they get you know typically left with less than five percent. But it depends, right? If the person's been working on the business for two months and they leave, they should have nothing. If you put your heart and soul into the business for three years, you definitely want to have more than five or ten percent because that was all the time and efforts, and you could have been paid much more on a salary working for some large corporation. So. You know, it's it's complicated, and of course, it changes uh, with time as well. Perfect. Um, and then, in terms of 
um, shopping deals. What do you suggest for founders in the situation that you mentioned where they have a lead investor who comes in, they say they can't shop the deal, but there's a remaining 250K that the founder needs to go out and um, secure. Have you seen situations where founders go out and in the midst of trying to secure the 250K, someone comes in with a lead and with a um, offer to lead. And then a founder's in a situation where it's going to look like to the other investor that they have, um, you know, not followed the terms that they've outlined. Yeah, it's a great point. Well, firstly, of course, if, uh, you know, the, these are essentially these exclusivities were without the permission of the person who signed the term sheet. So, you know, if as part of the deal, you're going to be raising another 250k in addition to what they're providing, then of course, you know, you're going to drop them an email or you're going to put in the term sheet. In, in that particular term sheet, it says, you know, not in accordance with this term sheet. So you already have the okay to go shop as long as it's not going to oust them from the round. The challenge is um, where you've got somebody who is potentially lead investor. You know, it's not always the case that signing a term sheet has the investor come through. They may not pass, you may not pass due diligence, or maybe, you know, when uh, times were less good, they just pulled out of rounds. It's generally, I mean, a term sheet isn't legally binding. The whole point of a term sheet is it's the uh, sort of uh, it indicates a level of interest, but you can still pull out uh, the the particularly the investor if they don't see that you're passing their due diligence and so on. So you want to you know be cautious about signing that you can't find anyone else. What you might do, of course, is you you of course it doesn't really prevent you having talks on the side but you have to be careful how public it is and how far you get with those other talks whether it be you know it's seen as soliciting uh, other investment or other people are calling you and you're talking to them and you're keeping it as a plan b but knowing that it doesn't rise as far as soliciting investment it's a complicated one okay um, Sam, we'll go to a question from you. Um, remind if you want to ask a question live, please raise your hand. Um, okay, so Sam's asked, um, oh no, it's not Sam's question. This one's further up. Oh no, it is Sam. You just left two comments. Okay. Um, on these types of terms, would it be a no deal or are SEIS, EIS funds quite negotiable? I think he's talking about the, um, yeah, the associated fees. It, it, my my co-founder says everything's a negotiation, but uh, the SEIs funds, you know, they they're mass investors, and uh, they probably are going to be more pushy for some. Well, things like founder vesting and so on. The, when you get a term sheet from the investors, they'll make their best guess three year vesting for all founders, but your mileage might be different. Maybe you don't want to. Maybe you've been working on the business for three years already and your shares are all vested. You don't want to start your vesting all over again. So maybe you will refuse to do that or maybe you'll agree that half your shares will remain already vested and half will start revesting. So with share vesting, you can definitely negotiate because the investor just made an assumption on the state of your business, but you know the state of the business. When it comes to the fees, those for SEIS, EIS funds are usually not really going to be negotiable. It might depend on how hot the deal is and whether they really want in. But the problem is the fund structure is predicated on them making money in, in this way. So they may or may not. The management fees, capping it for a certain number of years may well be possible. But I think the fees might be uh, different. You know, if you're talking to the crowd platforms, those fees very much are negotiable. But I think on the funds, you you may find the fees are not. The cap for legal fees is, you know, I, I suppose the more mass it is, the less negotiable it is. So if you're going to Y Combinator, it says, here's our term sheet. You can sign it or you cannot. It's your choice. There is no negotiation. If you're talking to a fund that does five investments a year, everything's a negotiation. And somewhere in between is a typical SEIS fund where, you know, the, some of the things they've just gone, dude, we do this so often, we're not interested in uh, negotiating. And some will. Perfect. 
Um, okay, Julianne, question from you. Um, what sort of terms do family offices tend to ask for better or worse than angels, SAIS funds, and VCs? That is a great question. So what is a family office? Well, you know, you've got angel investors who uh, will invest. Family offices are very wealthy angel investors who go, well, I can't be asked uh, looking for these deals myself. So they hire somebody uh, and they will handle their wealth. And, uh, you know, some of the, the their investments, in fact, often most of the investments will be things like stocks and bonds and property. And some of it will be startup investment. So in theory, you know, if you see the website of a family office, if they have a website, they'll tell you that because they just have one person who's got the money, they don't have an investment committee, they can move much faster. But the problem I think with family offices is I, I think they've often got what I call the B team. So when you have a VC, they're doing many deals a year. So they know what's market standard and they know they just, you know, they want to return on investment. So there's a certain formula that a VC has. But when you come to a family office, most of their investments might have been, you know, renting and buying office space in central London. And uh, now there comes a startup deal and, you know, the, the, their team aren't used to doing these startup deals. So they may approach it with the rigor of buying an office building in the CBD and it's totally mismatched. So you, uh, you know, definitely talk to family offices, but you may find that you have to do a bit of coaching with them, depending, you know, they're different, but some of them may need a bit of coaching or may come up with really weird terms. They might ask for guaranteed return on investments or that you'll sell the company within a certain number of years, which you should always avoid doing because, you have no idea how well the company is doing. Imagine you said you're going to sell a company in five years. You think that business is brilliant. Um, uh, it's going to be brilliant in five years. And actually in five years, it's not really sellable. So you've got a great business. You're paying yourself a salary. You're employing people. You've got customers who love what you're doing, but you're just not in a sellable state that's not profitable enough. And you'd get a tiny amount for selling the business, but you've committed to it. So really never, ever commit to selling the business. And also, by the way, be careful to never say that you have plans to sell the business if you're raising from SEIS or EIS investors. And if you're doing your advance assurance on seed legals, my team will look for those, any such promises that you make in pitch decks and ask you to remove them because HMRC can deem it as a, if they see it amounts to a prearranged exit, then that will disqualify it. SEIS or EIS. So we've switched from family offices to don't talk about uh, exits, and we can dive into that further. But but definitely, uh, you know, investors might say, "We well, are you planning to sell the business?" And you can say, yeah, "Absolutely." You know, we've thought about Salesforce might love to buy us in future years, and you know, when the time's right, we'd be obviously you know, looking to sell. But it's far too early to talk about that now. But definitely never say we're going to commit to selling the business in you know X number of years because it can also put you in a position where you're forced to sell for nothing. And maybe the investor decides they're going to make an offer to buy you for pretty much nothing. And because you're forced to sell, you've now snookered yourself. So uh, avoid that. Right. Um, okay, question from Harry. Um, they are seed legals. He's a seed legals customer and wants to know about the new investor finding service that you're launching. All right, great question. So on seed legals, you know, we've always helped you do the legals, but we've assumed you find the investors. But of course, you know, it's a good fraction of all startups on seed legals and quite a few investors. And we thought at some point we should put the two together. Um, and so currently, if you are revenue making. Um, so it's not pre-revenue because it's, I mean, it's a difficult area, then uh, drop me a note and you can copy Johnny, well, drop me a note and I'll do the intro. Um, and uh, then we can see if we can get, uh, if it qualifies, then we'd love to be able to list you and see if we can find investors. And there's no upfront commit. If we don't find anything, there's no cost to you. And if we do, we charge 2% of the investment that we find for you. And of course, we're delighted that you find 
investment yourself. So you essentially you'd create a pitch page on Seed Legals, and then we'd list it in the deals section. And then our our goal is to bring more investors to the deals section. We've soft launched. There are only a couple of companies, three or four companies listed at the moment, but the goal is to ramp that up over the coming months. So if of interest, drop me a note and I'll connect you with Johnny and we'll take it from there. Anthony, sorry, I'm, 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 that's my question. Sorry, why, why not pre-revenue? Isn't that lots of startups going to be raising pre-revenue? Yes, they're very true. But the challenge is that as we introduce this, we don't have we, have, we have to bring it to investors. And so if it's too early on, we just don't have the number of investors line up. So we have to do it more gently to launch as a new product. One day, there'll be thousands of investors browsing it. One of our challenges is that there are lots of investors on C Legals, but we can't start emailing them all because they were brought by other founders for their rounds. So we have to, as a more gentle approach, so since we have to limit the number of companies, our starting point is going to go find the post-revenue ones at launch and then expand it more widely. All right. Um, question from... Alexandra, do you have any advice slash can you help with terms when two startups enter a partnership? We might need to get Ooh. a little bit more specific than that. Alexandra, do you want to add anything to it? Hi. And Hi. Uh, thanks very much for today. Um, I, I think the session was uh, extremely useful. I don't think I can get more specific, but um, even from you know our group here, um, um, there are some founders um, that we operate in the same space, and we're thinking of maybe entering a partnership. Um, so obviously, this is a complete new territory for both of us, and yeah. uh, will come with a lot of like legal um, stuff. So, is this something that you could potentially help us with? Um, it's a great question so let's start with a more generic answer so often you know that you're going to find a company it could be a competitor or someone synergistic and you think there's a partnership and so you might put it in a few levels right so the lowest level partnership is there's no you know corporate merger of any sort you're just referring people to each other and then you might do some technical integration and you might have a, just a working relationship agreement. Then if you're going above that, you might have a joint venture of sorts and then there might be an acquisition and, and so on. So the first thing is uh, joint venture. My wife is a genius lawyer and she says never ever do joint ventures. They're a disaster. It's impossible to unwind them and, and so avoid. So I will just never do a joint venture. So... Of course, if you are, you know, super early stage and you haven't raised investment yet, then there's no problem with the both parties getting together and go, great, we'll just make one company and we'll get split the shares between us and this company will disappear or this company will acquire this company. I have 50% shares, you've got 50% of the shares, you know, together we'll each have, you know, 25% each with four founders now, whatever it might be. So if you haven't raised investment, you know, the world is free and easy for you to do these kind of things. Your challenge is if you have raised investment, particularly from SEIS or EIS investors, these mergers will often have them lose their SEIS and have to repay the SEIS. So I would think that, you know, if you want to drop me a note uh, to explore further, I'm delighted to share some more thoughts. Um, but, but the short answer is uh, free fundraise, knock yourself out. After fundraise, it gets complicated. And essentially, one company is you know, probably going to acquire the other. And then the question is, how do you preserve SEIS, or particularly the one being acquired, and make sure you don't lose it for the one doing the acquiring? Thanks. And, and, but, yeah. And, and, and in between, there's, of course, no reason why you can't explore some simple synergy that uh, has you send customers to them and them to you, although presumably the reason you're asking is you wanted something a lot more than that. 
So um, we have to wrap it there, unfortunately. Um, Anthony, thank you so much for your time. We will link Seed Legals. Um, I know you usually share your email. You're comfortable sharing your email? Yeah, you can reach me at anthony at seedlegals.com. I'm sure the uh, hotbed folks will share that and uh, also you know, connect on LinkedIn, Anthony Rose. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Purdy, you want to stop the recording? And usually, Purdy and I stick around for a few minutes. We have to run to another call. So, message us if you have any other questions.